If you're incident command, your job is not to put out the fire. Your job is to call the firefighter that's going to go put out that fire. And you you are the conductor of this show that's about to go on. Um, you find a lot. Um, I wrote a piece uh, around the time of that incident that was like, don't have a superhero culture, right? Um, it was actually a blessing for us that one of our superheroes on our security team that winds up taking on a whole lot was sitting on a beach um, with his family uh, at the time of that incident. So we couldn't call him. Uh, that was a blessing honestly yeah for for us because it was like hey this is life without him like let's let's go hi everyone this week i am joined on the future of security operations podcast by matt johansson matt is a security veteran who has helped defend startups from the biggest financial companies in the world uh to yeah small startups to uh yeah some of the most reputable security startups that have uh, that have existed uh, and everything in between Alongside his day job as head of software security at Reddit, he teaches companies how to protect against cyber attacks, coaches entrepreneurs and CISOs uh, that need help with infrastructure, application, cloud and security policies. He writes his own newsletter, Vulnu, uh, and talks about the power of vulnerability for growth. Matt, uh, you're incredibly accomplished and I'm delighted to welcome you to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Um, Let's start like a little bit later on in your career, you've had some really interesting roles at Goldman Sachs and Bank of America, but you had a bit of a gear switch and you moved to Reddit. What What's exciting about Reddit? What drew you to Reddit? Yeah, I've been a Reddit user for a very long time. Uh, so uh, I was kind of excited when this opportunity popped up. Uh, I put in my social media bios that I'm helping to protect the internet. It's a little tongue in cheek, like, hey, I'm a security guy. I'm helping to protect the internet. But I, I really put that there when I started working at Reddit because I, I really... Uh, it's synonymous with like the old internet to me in my brain. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you, you know, some countries they don't, they, they, they refer to Facebook as the internet. Like for me, Reddit like is the internet. Like it's the, it's the best and the worst of it um, uh, all together. And so, yeah, I, uh, when I was interviewing there, I, I passed my like 10 or 11 year cake day on my account. So I'm a long time, nice. uh, long time user, even before I worked there, obviously. And um, so, yeah, I was just really excited to, to, to get the chance to do that. I kind of like you, you mentioned briefly, I did my tour in the big financials, um, but I was really born and bred in like Silicon Valley startups, uh, kind of a little bit faster pace uh, environment, a little bit more, um, you know, easier to turn the turn the ship than the uh, the aircraft carrier that is uh, a, a major bank. Although that's probably a bad analogy. I think aircraft carriers turn pretty quickly, I'm sure. But you know, you, you get what I'm saying. It's it's uh it's harder to 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 get things done uh as quickly at some of those large organizations. So kind of getting back to what felt like more of a, a little startup, uh, and also just like, you know, the emotional connection for me to a website I've used since I was very young. So yeah, I, I and a website that has a whole lot of good security advice and security subreddits so that uh, I share, and certainly there's a whole lot of yeah MSPs and vendors that are on there that support their uh, their teams from uh, or their teams and customers from the yeah from the side as well. So it's 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 not yeah not just a, a yeah not just a place for fun. There's a lot of a lot of yeah, good security advice that you can find on there as well. Um, yeah. And it's yeah. like, it, it, like I said, it's a Silicon Valley company. So, you know, we're like one of the larger Kubernetes clusters I've ever worked with, right? So we've got the tech side of the house that's giving presentations at KubeCon and things like that, right? And so, you know, it's uh, it's it's good to kind of roll my sleeves up and, and get back at it again. That was the other thing, career transition wise, I went from leading a very large team at B of A to being on a very small uh, team at Reddit. So it's okay, back to... Uh, back to the hands-on security stuff versus uh, a little bit of cat herding um, at, the, at the the large organization. So that was cool too. But yeah, it gives you a lot of, yeah, mm -hmm. broader experience for sure. Um, so, so yeah, so tell us a little bit about, about the role. What What's important to the success and what, like, yeah, what, what does the, what does a, a small team involve? Yeah. So uh, it's, yeah, it was a shockingly small team for the size website we are and the age we are, right? We're, we're kind of, uh, uh middling in the like 30s right um for yeah. for uh, security plus privacy um and so yeah i came on uh as uh just they made me kind of a security architect and i was uh you know more of a helper to the CISO, throw me at hard projects kind of person and now i wound up uh running software security there which is mostly appsec right now um but yeah. it, you know it's going to involve prodsec and uh and, and a few other things so 
Um, so yeah, we, we, we divvy up the team, like a lot of teams, uh, and focus on the 80% that, you know, matters. Right. And, and, you know, we don't get to do a lot of the 20% luxury stuff. Uh, it's always fun to compare, uh, the large financial, you know, Hey, well, we had a tool that did that. And we had a team that did this and we had, you know, 13 people that managed this one thing. And it's like, okay, yeah, we don't have any of that. So what do we got to do right now to like get this risk, uh, as low as we can. So, um, you know, blessings and curses that you don't have, uh, as much resources, uh, and as large of a team, uh, as kind of a large financial institution would, but, you can move a lot quicker. You can, you know, just kind of, you can leverage open source a lot faster. You can, um, without a lot of the, you know, heavy regulation environment, you can, uh, you can, yeah, you're a little bit more nimble. So, um, we tend to be a bit of a like scrappy build, build it ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we'll evaluate a bunch of tools and then if, it, if nothing works really quick, it's like, all right, let's, let's do this. Come on, you know, nose down, let's figure it out. Right. Let's grab some open source project and Frankenstein it into our environment, whatever it is. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just focus on what matters. Right. So that's, that's, uh, that's the gist of it. Yeah, uh, and I'm sure yeah, some of your experience in startups will definitely uh, definitely help with that nimbleness and definitely help with that focusing uh, focusing on the eighty percent. It's funny we like are so we're a startup ourselves, but times is like our ICP or our ideal customer used to be that like uh, kind of fast growing tech startup who was like nimble and who was doing exactly the same sort of things as Reddit, uh, but we were always very nervous about getting into those like really large enterprise deals because we're like, how are we going to support them? And then all of a sudden we realized, well, actually they've they've got a team of 20 people that are doing this. It's actually quite easy to to yep. support them. Just give them the tool, give them a little bit of training and they're, they, they'll make themselves very successful. Yep. Uh, yep. But yeah, it's, it's amazing to see what, yeah, those larger companies, that the resources they have. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, you're still securing a... Yeah, you're like a, a top twenty website in the world. So there's, uh, there's, I'm sure no end of challenges. Can you t yep. tell me about some of the challenges that you've, you've had, some of the things that you've had to, yeah, the, the harder things that you've had to, I suppose, to solve or had to deal with. Yeah, uh, I think you know, for us, it's you know, when we go all, when we go in on something, we really have to go all in because you know, if we dedicate you know two or three people to a project, that's okay. That's you know, that's that team is working on that for now, right? And so, if things don't go the right way, and and you have to backtrack a little bit, that's always a little hard. Um, mm -hmm. We're we're the the good thing is the culture is very. Um, we don't get into sunk cost fallacy easily. So that's I've awesome. seen I've seen things that you know we've spent. Uh, a ton of money on and a ton of time on um, just be like, okay, that didn't work. Rip it out. Let's go. Like, let's do it the right way. Um, lesson learned. Right. And, and that's, uh, that's not uh, something I can say for everywhere that I've ever experienced. Right. Especially places that I've like consulted or, or stuff like that. Usually you get a little entrenched with something, right. Either someone kind of hung their hat uh, on a, a partnership and they're like, Nope, I got to make this work. Cause that's, that's my head uh, is making this work. And that's so frustrating. Yeah, I ran um, security infrastructure for a little while in. Uh, I'll be careful here. A little in a, in a previous previous company, and uh, as 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 I was leaving, uh, there was a team that decided that for their yeah for for for, for their uh, the, the product for Corp we used uh, we used Splunk, but for their product uh, they're like oh we're gonna roll our own sim because we think the logs are gonna be uh, logs are gonna be you know standard enough and it'll be fairly uh, fairly easy and. Yep, they their heels were firmly dug in for a long time, uh, and there was definitely a bit of a sunk cost fallacy for uh, for a little yeah. bit to it. But and don't get me wrong, there were definitely benefits to it. But yeah, you you ended up a lot of uh, a lot of hours and a lot of uh, just yeah, just time focused on something that yeah, ultimately we didn't need to be uh, experts in. I think. Yep. So I'll say we don't we don't do that, but it, that does come on the other side of that with some serious hardships of like, all right, like <laughs> let's uh, let's do this over again, right? Or let's dedicate the the work to do this right. And um, but it's good. We're you know we we're we're always better for it. Um, yeah. I mean, some of the challenges of just being Reddit, right? Are like yeah. are uh, you know, we're every decision our leadership makes gets under the microscope of the like internet and they all have a megaphone on our own platform right so like um you know sometimes it's hard to be the internet's punching bag while you go to work in the morning right <laughs> it's uh okay like let's you know let's uh we got to do what we got to do and i always people always ask me about stuff and i'm like yeah i just you know i work there 
yeah. I just work there. I'm not. I'm not. No one's calling me and asking me about uh, about any of these decisions. So. Yeah, it's, it's especially interesting being the the punching bag and the boxing gloves at the same time. At though. the That's same not, time. Uh, yeah. 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 Not that. Uh, yeah. Not not that much fun. You. So. So I wanna. I wanna just like get some of the lessons that you've learned. You, you worked in some. Um, yeah. What I consider almost like. Uh, you know, startup security royalty in, in White Hat back in uh, back in the day. <laughs> How did that experience inform some of the some of the work that you're doing now or some of, some of your later career? Yeah, I, I White Hat is a special place in a lot of our heart that that got to got to work there. We all a lot of us keep in touch, um, and uh, and yeah, I mean it was it was a, it was a special team, special time. We I like to say that um so White Hat was really really early to the game, too early, right? White Hat mm-hmm. was around since like 2002 doing trying to do AppSec, right? Yeah. Um and so they were they were vastly too early and luckily they they were able to kind of stay afloat until um until AppSec really took off. Um and so I I like to say that I got there right at the bottom of the hockey stick, so I, I was pretty lucky. I think mm-hmm. I was employee 40 something. 50 something. I, I can't, I can't remember at this point, but, um, but uh, soon after working there, Sony got hacked and that's like, it was kind of like oh a pivotal. Gosh. Yeah. It was a pivotal time. I, I talk about it on Twitter occasionally. It, it was, it was the hack that everyone got a piece of, right? All the security companies got a little like <laughs> piece of Sony. They trying dumped to pick all up. the data, right? They dumped, dumped everything. So the reason that's uh, the reason I point to the Sony hack being a pivotal time in AppSec was, AppSec was a thing already at that mm-hmm. point, right? People were doing penetration tests on their like websites. Uh, they everyone had knows about cross site scripting and SQL injection at that point already, right? Like, and I kind of just put those two as the big dogs in, um, in AppSec incident land at the time. Um, but what that one changed was it was a small like Brazilian forum. That Sony owned. It was like a very, very small web property of theirs that had SQL injection in it that then like w- was able to pivot to the whole, like everything, right? And so mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm fuzzy on the details, like 15 years in, in the future here or whatever. I think it was like 09 um, or 10. I can't remember. And um, yeah. And uh, but that was the turning point. And people realized, oh, I don't just have to like test my main flagship.com website oh crap i have to test everything right and you, you have a lot of these mega corps that really just pump out domains um and just don't even they don't even know what they have on the internet right and a lot of that connects back to the same data that their their flagship does and so that was really the turning point where appsec like concern and and then in turn spend like went through the roof right and so the so the industry kind of um had a, had a major major turning point there it's like oh crap we got to find sql injection everywhere <laughs> we got to find cross-site scripting everywhere um because you know a lot of the, the cookies are shared across you know the, these domains and a lot of uh a lot of the data was was all the same so that was a that was a huge turning point you asked them my lesson learned so yeah like just just in general like I, a lot of us consider white hat like none of us went to grad school or anything mm-hmm. like that we, we consider white hat like uh, a bunch of us didn't even go to university um i hired one of my best hires that uh that i hired out of uh out of white hat was uh delivering pizzas um when when i brought him on and he turned out to be an awesome static code analysis uh guy so um we we really just had like a we had a unique um program i started as a web app pen tester there really like cut my teeth on pen testing just hundreds and hundreds of uh, of web apps really quickly so instead of like a consultant job where mm-hmm. you would just kind of do one or two like i was just grinding out web app pen tests all day um we had it like in a really kind of interesting factory model at the time um with our research center and then i wound up running the the threat research center there that's what brought me to texas i'm still stuck in texas thanks to white hat (laughs) they they moved me down here and i I wound up staying um but uh but yeah I, i hired a bunch of the the web app researchers down here um in Texas, I think I was the first there. I picked the carpet for the for the dang office. I was the first one down here, and I, I hired uh, about sixty five before I left, just doing um, pen tests and static code analysis, and a few developers developing on the product and and things like that. So, I learned how to grow a team from basically zero, <laughs> run you know run them, promote them, hire them. I probably interviewed. I think I did the numbers at some point. I, I think I crossed a thousand interviews there at some point. Um, we were just constantly hiring, so. Um, 
you learned a lot from from the fire hose that was was all that <laughs> a fire that is practically the definition of a fire hose a thousand yeah. inches. like i got i gotta dive in there um so yeah somebody's listening to this podcast and they're starting out what, what like what were some of the things that you were looking for you said one of the best people you ever hired was a pizza delivery guy Deliver pizzas yeah how, like i suppose yeah but what are you what are you looking for especially yeah especially for appsec because we, we've had a bunch of people on talking about kind of sock and ior but for, for appsec what, what skills are you looking for yeah, caveat that this was, uh, you know, some Back years ago day, now, yeah. right? A little bit, right? The, you know, we're talking 2011, 2012, right? So yeah, about 10 years ago. So the 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 landscape has changed a little bit, but I think my answers are still roughly the same. So mm-hmm. um, so we we had a, a, a pretty solid interview that could, and we gave you the, we gave you the answers before you showed up, was our model, yeah. right? It was like, hey, go study this. You don't need to know anything. Here you go. You let us know when you want to schedule your interview. You you take as long as you want with, here yeah. you go, right? Um, it was basically the OWASP top 10 and a few other things. It was just like, hey, be able to talk about this stuff. And then, you know, the more you know about it, the better kind of thing, right? Yep. Um, and we, you know, we gave some links. that We we liked uh, the Web Application Security Consortium was another thing back then that we liked uh, better than OWASP at the time. I, I've lost track if that's even still a thing, WASC. Um, but uh, OWASP is obviously the famous one, yeah, yeah. the more famous one. Um, and then, yeah, we said, Hey, come in the interview. We, we, um, and the whole point of the interview was to get to, get to a point that you didn't know the answers anymore. Right. So like I told everyone that going in, I was like, we're going to ask questions until you don't know. (laughs) So like, don't feel bad when you don't know something. And it's just kind of like, and then I'm going to try to explain it to you a little bit and then see if I can get that like one or two steps beyond that to see if you can literally learn right now, like what we're talking about. Um, and a lot of it was just like finding vulnerability, like how to find vulnerabilities, because that's what I was hiring for, right? Mm-hmm. Was uh, kind of junior web app pen testers. So, um, so I really looked for the ability to learn and just the passion for the for the subject, right? So you know, because we'd give some people that homework and they'd come back with it, memory, like they'd come back, you know, experts on the on the OS top ten, right? It's like yeah. okay, this person's obviously going to make it, right? Like they they went home and they read everything. And then you'd give someone these like these answers and they'd come in dumbfounded. And it's like, I gave you the answers, right? <laughs> like, so that's if, if you're looking to start out, yeah, just prove prove passion, right? Just just like if you really want it, like prove that you want it. Go go out and do do the extra learning and stuff like that. If anyone came in with any sort of experience in like an open source project or um you know, a con like a, hey, I, I I did this conference talk or bug bounty was like Bug bounty was in its infancy at the time. Nowadays, that's like a perfect way that you can like prove your knowledge on something. You don't know there's no interviews for bug bounties. Just go find the bug bounties <laughs> and, yeah. and then put put that on your resume. Look what I found, right? Um, but yeah, I always point people to, you know, if you can contribute to an open source project, if you can find bug bounties, if that's what you're spending your free time as like if you're a student or you know, early in your career, and that's what you're spending your your extra time on. That's gonna just pay dividends for you. Bug bounty literally is gonna pay you <laughs> to do it, and then you're gonna be able to go talk about it. That's that's my appsec advice still uh, in 2024 for sure. That's incredible. I I, I love it, and yeah, it, it's like it, it, it's not all that uh, dissimilar at all from the advice that I give for uh, for somebody starting out in yeah looking for a career in the sock. Definitely like be curious. Um, and uh, we do the same for uh like our engineering team here where we give you a challenge we say like this isn't super hard just we just want you to go out do a little bit of research and come back in and you're almost you're asking people to self-select in right as in like hey you're you just do a little bit of work and you'll yeah yeah. and if you if you do then brilliant and we'll like hopefully it'll come back to you in uh in spades for those junior roles that's it you're just looking for the ability to learn and like some baseline knowledge hey you know the lingo a little bit i can talk to you you know it right because you've read it like you've watched some conference talks something right you're you're not dumbfounded about it and then i want to you know i want to he- just like see how you think a little bit see if you can problem solve on your own right and it's that bit as well i've i've, I've always loved that uh like ask people hey how would you you know analyzing a phishing email or how would you analyze this threat and they you know will have three or four different things learned off and then you ask them and then like what would you do next and then just seeing that like the the yeah the you know 
the dial spin a little bit. They're like, oh, I, maybe this. And then you're like, yeah, okay, this is uh, this person knows how to think of their feet. And that's definitely going to happen in a security incident where you're like, oh, what are we going to do next? Or what's the, what do I need to, who do I need to talk to? What more data do I need? Oh, 100%. Really, uh, yeah. I mean, I interview now for non appsec roles, right? We're talk, we were talking about my White Hat experience, yeah. which was, was yeah, Firehose, yeah. right? Now I interview for more senior um, SOC cloud engineers yep. i interview for a ton um you know still some appsec but yeah as you hire like as you interview for more senior people it's like hey what have you done like pr like prove prove experience in a lot of these things and then prove that like again you can problem solve that's just like evergreen evergreen advice right that's like any good structured interview is structured in a way that like the person doesn't necessarily know the answer you're not like trying to see that they know all the answers you're trying to see how they how they kind of figure things out and and just like relate to the problem and sit and pause for a second and don't get flustered and and think about it and come to a logical conclusion. There a lot of questions that I ask on interviews don't have right answers. Like that's like a, another thing. I, I like to build a scenario and just see how you walk through it. There's not like a up oh, here's the you know here's the A plus answer here's the whatever. It's like okay, did you mention some important things? Did you at least kind of recognize the problems that i was laying out did you like hit hit the right stuff and and approach it the right way that's like yeah. worth way more to me than like knowing the textbook and yeah like the the thing that i 100 i think that, that i've always in, uh, enjoyed as well people will because they know in certain roles like hey i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you hey tell me about like if it sells the deal that you lost uh, or the deal that you won or whatever and like they'll they'll have that story prepped but then it's like hey what what did you learn from it and how did you uh, how did you change what's the like what's the yeah what and how did people react when you put in those changes etc the value um, is always that one extra step right okay cool we asked the question okay what's i'm going to push it a little bit further now let's see how you do it same thing with your example right okay you got your yeah. story but now let's push it one level past your prep right <laughs> yeah exactly and um, it seems like if, well, when when doing a little bit of research on, uh, and you you've been involved in like sharing and trying to teach people for a long time. What got you involved in, I suppose, like content and sharing and teaching and yeah, yeah, giving back to the community. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's part of my personality. Just going way back, right, even to like grade school and stuff like that. I was always very, um, you know, debate club and <laughs> you know, model government and. Uh, you know, things like that. And so I've, I've always really liked, um, getting involved just like with clubs and, and, and things like that. And, um, and so then in my career, yeah, I think I found a passion for it early because it helped, it helped springboard my, my career. Right. I, um, to date myself, I, uh, I, I left university and entered the job market during the financial crisis, um, of like that 08, 09 uh, time frame, right? Where uh, the economy really took a tank. And so getting a job and then entry-level InfoSec jobs were rare anyway. They still are, yep. right? Um, uh, and so uh, I was on the the early version of Twitter um, and, mm -hmm. and really made my relationships while sitting in my dorm room, made relationships with people that were established in cybersecurity, right? Which was kind of a like... People would have paid for the access that you had in like in in early Twitter days, and and some people just laughed at it. <laughs> you know, they're like, "Oh, it's like, you know, you're tweeting about your lunch." And I was like, "No, I'm writing like the head of security at Juniper and asking him what he thinks about this blog post that he wrote." And, <laughs> and like, I get to do that for free, and he answers me. And like, this is just really strange um, thing I'm doing from my dorm room. Um, and so I think. Uh, finding a passion for it because it worked early in my career and just really latching onto it. Um, my first conference, which I, I'm very sad to hear that Shmukon, uh, Shmukon just happened this weekend and they announced that next year is their last one. That was my first ever security conference with Shmukon like four or five. Mm -hmm. um, and I got there uh, by, I tell this story uh, a few times. So I, I was on Twitter I was broke as a joke, university, you know, fresh out of university, mm -hmm. had to move back in with the parents because didn't have a job. Like I was like mm -hmm. in a depression about it. I was like, man, I don't want to move back home with, with mom and like this sucks. And well, I, you know, I want a job, I, you know, whatever. And so I was like, I got to get to this security conference. And that was the closest security conference. I was in New York city and uh, that's where I grew up. And uh, I had to go get down to DC and this group of people on Twitter were in Boston talking about renting uh, an RV and driving down to DC together. 
and it was Jack Daniel, Chris Hoff, Zach Lanier, like Space Rogue, uh, Bill Brenner, um, like a bunch of these security, like big names in security at the yeah. time and still, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, talked about going down to Schmookon in, in an RV. And so I wrote Jack Daniel. Um, if you guys don't know Jack, he started Security B Sides, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, yeah. you probably, you probably know Jack. It was, <laughs> and so I wrote Jack and said, Hey, are you taking I 95, this highway down from, from Boston to DC? He said, Yeah. I said, If I get to I 95, can you pull over and, and get me? And he said, Sure. And so I got on a train um, <laughs> in New York and got to I-95 in New Jersey and uh, popped up stairs. Uh, and it was like a truck stop and this RV pulled over and they let me in and took me to D.C. with them. And I slept on a friend's couch when I got down there and <laughs> I, I I had no money for for anything, but I, I would, you know, like beg and and <laughs> plead and buy buy some people a beer or something like that just to like build a relationship yeah and i wound up meeting some guys down there that wrote for a blog called liquid matrix um at the time okay. it's not very active anymore it still exists but it's not very active but these two canadian guys ran that blog and they were down there um jamie arlen and dave lewis and uh and they met me and they they liked this whole story that i told them about basically hitchhiking on twitter to <laughs> down to this to conference and uh and they asked me to write for their blog and that's kind of how i started blogging um for on a bigger platform for them um and then we wound up starting a podcast together the liquid matrix crew so i was podcasting then at white hat i found some really cool bugs early in my career that turned into a black hat and defcon talk that so i found a love for conference talks from that so a lot of it's just like people i met on twitter turning into conference stuff turning into podcasting so I've yeah, I've just always had a passion for talking about infosec and teaching people and helping people get into it. I also think one of my superpowers, I don't I'm I'm I I have a vast imposter syndrome, so I don't I don't think a lot of really great things about myself. But one thing I I think I'm pretty good at is translating super technical security stuff yeah. into something that gen pop at, or close to gen pop can can understand and find interesting and I really really like doing that. So that was my uh, long smook on ramble. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. No. That, like fascinating. It's yeah. It's, it's strange how yeah one event can. Well, I suppose one event has probably changed a whole lot of people's uh people's lives. But even still, like an event like that, but where you've hustle is not the right word because it wasn't like you know hey trying to make loads of money out of it. But basically, yeah, you you slightly hustled your way into like yeah meeting some really cool people and changing you know changing the course of your your career. Yeah, I've always been good at putting myself in uncomfortable situations. Like mm -hmm. I'm massively uncomfortable with everything I just said, right? Like that was not easy, right? I wasn't like energized by walking into a, a bus full of strangers and being like, hey, can you <laughs> take me down? It was kind of born out of necessity. Like I knew that this would be good for me. And it was, right? I wound up like Chris Hoff was in that bus. Chris Hoff was the head of security at B of A. That like, that's how I got that job. So like, Fast forward 12 years after being in that bus and I got a job, right? I have a similar story that same summer going to DEF CON, not having any money yet, still didn't get a job or anything. And I met a bunch of people and, you know, bought some people some cigars uh, and like worked my way into groups that I had no business being in. I was, you know, 22, 23 years old mm -hmm. and <laughs> with all these established people. And one of the people there was Allison Miller, who wound up being the CISO, oh, of, yeah. uh, CISO of Reddit, who hired me at, at Reddit. So like, those first two security conference conferences I was at fast forward 10 years, they, you know, they were major pillar points in my career. So one, one of the things you talk about in your podcast uh, and on your newsletter and uh, uh, more is like mental health, but it, you also talk a little bit about imposter syndrome. It's interesting. Like you, you obviously have a little bit of it, but you, you I suppose you didn't, it, it seems like you, you were just able to overcome it then. How, t tell me about a, uh, yeah, talk to me a little bit about why that why that's important and I suppose how you, how you can over or what you do yourself to uh, you know to give yourself that confidence. You got to ignore it. You got to ignore it. I don't think it manifests as confidence really in myself, but you just got to ignore it and uh, pretend. I, I say you know fake it till you make it is like a funny saying, but it's like yeah. I don't know. I, I, I find in my career that a lot of times you're waiting to come into the room where, with a bunch of adults who have it all figured out, and I've never been in that room. <laughs> like yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> they don't uh, exist. I, I, <laughs> I've, I've, yep, I, I'm, yeah, it's, uh, it's not so much fake until you make it, until you'll realize that a lot of other people are faking it as well. And I've been in those, those rooms with incidents and those rooms with, yeah, like, yeah, whatever boardrooms and stuff. And in some cases, there are obviously wicked smart and really, really like great people. 
And then on other sides, you're like, I can't believe we're, you know, just talking about petty politics in this situation. It's it's crazy. This is uh, we're supposed to be more than this. I'm not even saying it's a bad thing, but at the highest levels, like picture like the highest levels of politics or your or your career ladder or whatever it is, you go into those rooms, they're having the same conversations. Yep. They're having the same doubts about their own feelings, I, their own decisions and, and all this kind of stuff. And then and then they work through it and they come to a decision and that's it. And they and they just go forward. That's that's the difference between the the, the top. And the bottom of the chain is just the ability to just continuously move forward, right? That's it. Um, uh, the overanalyzing everything they said as well. I mean, like, oh, did I did I do that right? A hundred percent. And they make wrong decisions. Yeah, yeah, like, of course. You know, like everyone's worked for, you know, super high up people that you just don't agree with their decision. And, they, you know, sometimes they're right and you were wrong. Sometimes it's vice versa. It doesn't matter. It's just like, ignore that little stupid voice in your head. Treat it like the enemy <laughs> and uh, and move forward. Um, yeah, hundred percent. So I, I want to like you. You've obviously uh, mental health is an area that's like close to your, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, very close to your heart. Um, I'd love to learn why. But just before that, you you also like you do a podcast, you do a newsletter, you're you know in charge of security at Reddit. Uh, you record YouTube videos, you come on other people's podcasts. Like, how do you, how do you look after yourself if you're doing all these uh these things? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh I get that question a lot. Um and yeah, I'm not going to lie and sugarcoat it, but y y like this year starting a lot of these like side ventures has just eaten into my sleep. That's like the the only way that I okay. could really get it done. Um I am finding a little bit more balance now. Um for sure, uh getting into a little bit of a rhythm. Um I've uh I've brought on a little bit of help uh on on the on the content side, so I'm not editing my own videos anymore. Yeah, I'm not I'm not editing myself anymore. I'm not, you know, uh, doing doing a lot of it uh, by myself uh, anymore, which is cool. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's just been like I just knew that it was worth it, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's it's like uh, pay the short price, like you you said, the hustle world. I I I don't really ever say like, oh, I'm out here hustling or doing whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I do know that anything that I've like gotten in my career or in my personal life has taken some level of like go out of your comfort zone and like yeah do something harder do something that you don't necessarily want to do kind of eat into some of the some of your own like leisure time to to get something else that you want whether it's you know spending an, an hour at the gym in the morning because you got to get up a little earlier or you know you can't watch that tv show at night because you want to write a blog or record a, a you know a youtube video or you know, um, stuff like that. So I, 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 I also understand I didn't answer your question just now. <laughs> How do I look after myself? So I do try, absolutely try to recognize like when I'm, uh, pouring more out of my cup than I'm putting in is like the mm -hmm. analogy I like to, to put it in. And I, and I do try to make sure that I do every week, some things that are filling my cup. Right. So I know the things that, that I value, um, that really, really helped me. I was like spending some time in the gym, taking care of myself. Uh, my sleep is really, really super important. I've, I put a lot of effort on getting enough sleep nowadays. Uh, time with my family is like hugely awesome. Right. Um, so I, I kind of have it down to a rhythm where I write a few nights a week. I, I record things a few days. Um, obviously I have my day job. Um, and then I try to take, you know, okay, like, the newsletter goes out Friday morning, so I'm doing a lot of work on it Wednesday and Thursday. So Friday night is no, nothing like turn it all off. Like we're going to yeah. go do something um, the weekend. You know, I spend a lot of time uh, recharging the batteries for sure um, and making sure that uh, I'm good. I've also recently um, found kind of a community, a, like a, a community here in Austin. That's like a wellness community that. Um, oh, nice. So I go to um, they do like meditation, sound bath type things. They do. um ice baths and, and like fitness classes. They do, um, like grief circles. They do group therapy type things. They, they have like a bunch of these types of events, um, that are really just meant to kind of like ground you in your, in your week. Some of it's a little woo woo for me. I don't really believe in, in a ton of the like new agey, uh, stuff that, that they practice, but I kind of leave some of my cynicism at the door going in and, 
just say, Hey, at the worst case scenario, I'm going to spend an hour just like really focusing on myself and, I, and recharging I, here. So I'm the here and now and the mindful to style that the like, even if it's, even if you're, you, you don't believe that the sound bath is going to help definitely having an hour where you're focusing on, you know, yeah. just being present. Exactly. In the sound like, bath is going like, to do yeah, maybe I don't believe in the vibrations and the crystals and all this kind of stuff. But yeah. I, what I do believe is like a, a deep meditation right That's now. Cool. And like, really just like being present in the moment is going to help ground me for for the rest of my week um, yeah. uh, a little bit, right. And try like every time I go to one of these events, I try to bring a little bit of what I learn, or what I feel into like my day to day, right. So I, I wrote a piece on mindfulness on my blog just last week, right, just about mm -hmm. like, Hey, instead of pouring that coffee in the morning and just slugging it down, just like think about it for a second. And like, hey, this is a plant that someone grew and picked and dried. And like now it's, you know, someone put it in a bag or someone made a robot that put it in a bag. And like, you know, and now like just sit and think about it and feel the warmth. And how does this warmth make you feel? And like, you know, just just think about what you're doing instead of just kind of going through life. Uh, there's a line I really like that I try to remind myself of a lot is just be an active participant in your life um it's just like yeah be, it is what it, it what it what it sounds like right just like be present and active in your life instead of just letting it all happen to you which i think i certainly fall victim to a lot right it, you can just default to like scrolling on your phone and doing showing up at work going to a few meetings you know ordering yeah. some delivery and going to bed right um I think a lot of it for me also, uh, I, I stopped drinking a year and a half ago. Um, that, that's been super, super helpful for, for me being present, right? I was kind of using booze as like a avoid the world mechanism for sure, right? So that's a lot uh, of security practitioners do, unfortunately. Yeah, I get it, right? Uh, you're, you're, you're high strung, you're on call, you're getting paged, right? You want to kind of yeah. check out and, and chill for, for an evening and you know, if you can do that responsibly without negatively impacting your health, I, I, I have yep. no, you know, I have no beef with, with alcohol, but, uh, for me, it just was the choice of like, Hey, I think this, I think this is a net negative at this point in my life. And so I stopped and it was kind of one of the best decisions, uh, I've made for myself personally. So. so, so for, so for, for those like security professionals that are dealing with some of those, you know, being on call and, uh, like dealing with that, um, I call it the sword of Damocles hanging over your head. That's something <laughs> that incident yeah. is gonna, is gonna come uh, and you know you haven't necessarily or you know you're th those patches haven't been applied or this uh you know vulnerability hasn't been investigated or whatever um so what, what advice or what, what are you doing in reddit to to help your team and how are how are you approaching like th those challenges like as a security leader yeah so we we try to really do uh, a good job with work-life balance it's something that um gets gets pretty hard especially as you go kind of up the career ladder you wind up being a default person that gets pulled into a lot of things yeah. even when you're not on call or you know necessarily responsible for a certain thing um so we try to just protect that as much as possible when people take their time like we we really really um force the time off thing um a lot of a lot of us will just work and work and work until you know, we're, uh, we're burnt out. It's just the personality type of, that, that InfoSec attracts for sure. Um, a lot of people think that if they take the time, it's going to negatively impact their career growth or something like that, or they're going to miss something or whatever it is, uh, or something's going to fail because they're not around. And, you know, I, I, I always try to tell people that, uh, it's not good to be a load bearing team member, right? <laughs> you, you gotta, you gotta, test the structure here that you that you've built and uh we can only test that if if you're gone um mm -hmm. so yeah we, we we try to encourage folks to take the time off and then when they take the time off uh like hey uninstall slack like don't like do not do not like try to like stay in touch or anything like that like really really check out really um go and recharge the batteries is like is the most important thing that i can say and then other than that um yeah, on call and stuff like that. We, you know, just try to share the load as much as possible, right? That like you, like we work in a in an industry that you're gonna have the pager, right? Especially on blue team, like things are gonna hit the fan, right? Um, yep. Uh, it's gonna happen a lot on U.S. holidays because the adversaries <laughs> know when U.S. holidays are, right? For the listeners in the U.S., uh, I think I used to go camping every July Fourth, and I think like three out of five years, I was, you know searching for cell service in the woods to be on an incident bridge because you know the adversaries know that 
hey, the team is thin uh, on these holidays. So that's that's taxing. And so, you know, we um, on my team, the same person just like luck of the draw was on call for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we ch- we made sure that didn't hit right. We were like, nope, yeah, switch, fair, yeah. switch this around. Like, what are we doing? Like, you know. So you just try to remember the human and everything. Hey, you know, these these aren't just names in a spreadsheet or something like that, right? You got to think about these people and their family and think about that when you're booking work travel. Think about that when you're booking on-call schedules and just really just give people the time to to recharge. Yep. You, uh, it's kind of switching your time a little bit, but you also have to be like, you know, you're, you're a small team, but you're, you know, you've got presumably more infrastructure than... Uh, pretty much any other company that I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be talking to. Um, I suppose, how do you make it easier for your, like y- your partners in your engineering team or your partners in like, well, yeah, for you, it's going to be pr- mostly the engineering team or the product team. How, how do you make it easier for them to do the right thing so that you're, you know, I'm shifting left is w- one way of saying it, but realistically you're making your, you know, you're, you're preventing, you're preventing problems like down the line. Yeah. I've been, I've been pitching this talk or working on this talk uh, this year, uh, called like something along the lines of shift left. We did it now. What? Yeah. Um, because we've been clamoring about shift left for over a decade, right. Um, you know, building, building security into the development pipeline, SDLC, um, CICD integration, scanning, all this kind of stuff. We've been clamoring about it forever. I'd kind of argue we've did it to a degree, like the, the like it, it that whole concept is much more mature than it was 10 years ago. I'm not saying like game over, we did it, but the ramifications of that are that now a lot of like really good security practices need to basically just be development practices. Um, It's really blurring the line. And so some of your best security engineering teams on the planet right now are engineering teams Yep, that also kind of know security. Um, they're they're both I, I I never like to pit the 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 two um disciplines against each other. Some people like to play that game of like, oh, security is actually harder to learn. So get security people and teach them how to code, or vice versa. Hey, being being a really good engineer is really hard and security you can you can learn in a weekend. I don't like to play that game. Um but uh I will just say the best security teams on the planet right now like have have that mix of both right um yep. that, that can really build and that's because we've been clamoring for the shift left for so long as i point right um <laughs> <laughs> the shift, the shift left for so long um but uh but you, then you wind up with a bunch of security analyst heavy teams that don't know how to code uh becoming hard like oh crap we really need some people on our team that can help build some stuff with our with our engineers so yeah, at uh, at Reddit, because we're a small security team and a large engineering org, we do have to rely a lot on our mm-hmm. pure engineers. Um, we also find a really good uh, partner with SRE, which is basically yep. like, I mean, DevOps so, and yeah. SRE, whatever. Yeah, um, they're really good security champions for us as well. I've yeah, I, I, back then I loved working with uh, yeah the SRE or tech ops as we uh, we kind of call them a lot, but they um, yeah they were fantastic, but they also they they taught me a lot because ironically like in, in Dakistan our product was ex- incredibly stable and um, it had to be but there were incidents all the time and they like as in somebody would you know do something and it'd, you know push some code and it'd break and they'd be like all right let's you know bring people on and it would we'd roll back and anytime there was anything um yeah like anything suspicious we be brought in and very very few of the t- those times it was you know anything like anything actually security related but they were you know best practice bringing us in so that we could uh we could do our due diligence as well but the calmness and the just the level of process maturity they had on their calls just taught me a lot about actually hey we need to manage these incidents and we need to communicate really effectively and we have no problem bringing these people in and it's not like a it shouldn't be a panic it should be this is part of our job and this is what we're it is what we're paid to do and we're like it's okay to you know wake that person up and ask them these questions and then say hey thank you i appreciate it all right next so it's like the the bane meme right of like oh incidents i was born in it yeah right? yeah like but the, the sres that's how they feel it feels like yeah. no this is their normal operating procedure yeah um security instant response is a muscle and if you don't work it out yep. it atrophies right and so sres live in it so they don't have to work it out because like the, the site is gonna have performance issues every day to some degree right like something not go down but something right yeah 
and they live in it. And so, yeah, they they are who, especially at Reddit, they are who the rest of the company learns and looks to for incident response. They've built all of the tools and Slack bots and all this kind of stuff that we yeah. use in an incident. SRE built them all. Um, mm-hmm. So so they're really, really good champions for us to like have our tendrils kind of go into the rest of the engineering org. SRE is like a good conduit into uh, into the rest of the org. Um, and then, yeah, obviously like a big thing, a big drum beat that we're doing right now is paved path to production and guardrails, uh, on, Netflix's on thing. yeah, it's been, it's been Netflix's, Boring. uh, championed it, but, um, you yeah, know, sorry. it's, you know what I'm saying? No, 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 for sure. No, yeah. no, you're, you're not wrong. And, um, but, uh, with, you know, with a light security team, that's really the direction that you have to go is, Hey, we can't be playing whack-a-mole with, um, with a small team, right? You don't have hundred people to throw at go find all the volumes in prod right it's like yeah. okay like what's the, the, the what's the way and what's the guardrails so that they don't you know like enable the develop make the default path that the developers take the secure path and they'll take it <laughs> so yeah that's it's it's really interesting i've read one or two uh yeah one or two their their blogs about it and it's been yeah it's pretty it's it's uh, yeah, it's just like it, it makes a whole lot of sense. They make it sound uh, they make it sound really easy, but it becomes one of my favorite things to say these days is like security is actually just a it's a communications problem where you just need to like build those relationships with all those other uh, with all those other teams and like ask them how like what's the best way to go about making sure that they're secure by default. But if you if you actually just build those relationships, you're going to be way more secure than if you buy 50 tools and uh not, yeah, put them put them to work not, throwing uh throwing money at yeah, it you know not even just the relationships i've been uh i I've, i wrote a piece last year that that security is actually developer experience mm-hmm. so if you've worked with developer experience yeah, teams go. it's all about getting the right tools in the developer's hands to do the right thing and it's like okay you know hey i've got a developer that's got a the key to prod on their laptop and they're traveling and it's like, why do they have the key to prod on their laptop? Well, they need it because they have to train machine learning data. And so they need the data and it's like, well, no, they don't need the real data. They need mock data. Well, no, the mock data is not big enough. Well, this is a developer experience problem, right? That's turning mm-hmm. into a security incident. Um, that's just one example. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. cr- cross-site scripting, right? Oh, you know, hey, they just did the work that they needed to do and and whatever. It's like, oh, well, why didn't we have like a linter or a test or something that said, hey, don't use that API in React because it's going to make cross-site scripting like happen, right? Um, okay, we'll build that into their, into their toolkit. So they don't even push the code that was wrong. It just immediately highlights as like, hey, this is a bad idea, right? Just in their, in their toolkit. So... That's the uh, that's the direction that that we're moving. That's the direction that I see a lot of the top security engineering teams that I like talk to in in various Slack channels and things like this. So if I talk to people, what they're really spending their time on, it's really this pave path guardrail stuff for AppSec at least for sure. Yeah, no, it, it's it, it's great, and it's also um yeah one of the things that I admire about Netflix and about a whole lot of other companies is that the culture of like being completely open to talk about security and like talk about the challenges and admit your failures and admit mm-hmm. your uh or like you know brag about your successes and they definitely mm-hmm. have a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of successes but for yeah looking from the outside it's yeah it's kind of refreshing but along those same lines it's it, it's really refreshing to see like uh organizations that are prepared to yeah prepared to talk about and the lessons they've learned from incidents and i noticed that uh, you, like Reddit had a security incident there uh, 12 months ago or so. And, but you not only like, yeah, we're open about it. You talked about lessons learned and you, uh, yeah, you, you shared with like, you shared it with the community and it was, uh, it's, yeah, it's great to, yeah, great to see. Can you, is there, I don't want to ask for any <laughs> no, private cool. information yeah, here, but is there anything, yeah. anything you can talk about? Like the, the decisions made behind that and yeah, yeah. some of the lessons you might've learned from that incident. Yeah. Happy to chat. Um, Yeah. We, um, Reddit is a default open culture, even internally. It's in, to the point where it gets us in, in trouble sometimes internally. Um, but it, it is like a core principle. It's a core principle of the website, right? It's like very mm-hmm. like, hey, transparency here, right? Um, so uh, this, you know, it's something it's baked into our org. The CEO um, has a weekly AMA, like in front of the entire company. Um, it, like anyone can ask him anything in front of the entire company every single week. Um, sometimes they're, you know, pretty basic what you would expect people to ask the CEO. Sometimes it's yeah. really hard questions like, 
Hey, I'm a trans employee in Texas. This law just hit the books. I'm worried gotcha. about it. Like, you know, whatever, like, and he'll answer it in front of the whole company. Right. And so, um, it, it's, it's really, really baked into our culture. It's, it's one of my favorite things about working here. Um, and so, yeah, the security incident you're talking about, I think we had our public blog on it out, uh, like three days, like three days from like moment of incident, um, which is light speed yeah, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if yeah. anyone's listening that doesn't work in uh blue team or incident response that's gonna take uh, three days to write a blog no it's incredibly no, hard the uh yeah. not write the blog the the fact that the cto published uh, the blog basically while the incident channel is still live uh and, it's, <laughs> and stuff yeah. like that um is light speed so yeah obviously it was something that it was containment was number one and you know and once we knew we were contained and we had like a really good idea of like impact um it was like okay we got to tell who do we got to tell all this kind of stuff we also mm -hmm. have very very good partnership with our legal team which made incident response um much much easier too by the way so pro tip to all you incident responders or socks out there go make fun go make friends with your lawyers um <laughs> having Having them involved was really good. Um, yeah, we, you know, uh, lessons learned. Also document the shit out of everything. Excuse my language. Um, just like document everything uh, mm -hmm. uh, as part of uh, as part of the process that makes everything so much easier, especially, you know, as you transition lead, like, you know, it was a wake up in the middle of the night situation. You, you have shifts. Um, so you're handing off to next shift because you have to go take a nap <laughs> yeah. uh if you didn't write anything down that whole time that that handoff is going to be super hard and then um hand again handing off to to legal or pr or anyone like that that i was instant command on this incident you're talking about and the highest praise i got was hey like you know this running incident doc that you had has just made everything so 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 much easier um so that's uh have a good doc and process so that you know if you get paged like okay right here's here's what's going on um know who to bring in right is like the other like biggest thing if you're instant command your job is not to put out the fire your job is to call the firefighter that's going to go put out that fire and you you are the conductor of this show that's about to go on um you find a lot um i wrote a piece uh around the time of that incident that was like don't have a superhero culture right um it was actually a blessing for us that one of our superheroes on our security team that winds up taking on a whole lot was sitting on a beach um, with his family uh, at the time of that incident. So we couldn't call him. Uh, that was a blessing, honestly, yeah. for, for us. Cause it was like, Hey, this is life without him. Like let's, let's go. Uh, yeah. And uh, it just makes you realize that like, Hey, we, we have to kind of practice that. And every team I've ever worked on has those superheroes that it's like, Hey, no matter what, like you wind up calling that person, don't right. Figure out how, figure out how not to, they're going to leave at some point, <laughs> right? Like they're going to, they're going to retire. They're going to find a new job, whatever. Um, and I'll t tell you from, yeah, from personal experience that the reason, the reason that our superhero, when I worked in a, in a previous place and he's, and he'd be listening, we'll figure this out that he's still working at work very closely with me today. Uh, the reason he left was because he got the call and he got the call on his honeymoon. And that he didn't didn't so like, like join that, or anything right? like that, but yeah. he he like we needed we needed like him to be able to tell us something. And uh, yeah, that that just should never happen, right? Nope. Exactly. So, so yeah, I mean that that kind of stuff you gotta get away from in incident response, it's particularly important to get away from it. Because the incident's gonna happen when that yeah. person is on their honeymoon, right? It's gonna happen. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give a shout out to Tynes here too. They like uh, you guys are such a good community to like the community is giving talks for you guys. Like without you being involved, infosec people are getting on stage at conferences to be like, "Here's how I built this in Tynes to make incident response easier." Um, I've seen a lot of those talks; they're really good. Uh, and yeah, you guys are a huge lifesaver in automation on that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, they didn't ask me to say this. That's not why they asked me to be on them. <laughs> For your listeners, they, Tom might even be cringing that I'm doing it. But um, thank you. But no, but seriously, like, uh, you know, in incident response, the speed is what matters. The people that have gotten the same threat actor that hit Reddit has hit a lot of the headline making breaches that you've mm -hmm. read about over the last year. Um, 
due to a fishing incident, right? If you've read about fishing incident, it's likely uh, a small subset of people. The the incidents that you read about that have the smallest impact and like the fastest time to fix, it's because they've automated something and likely times was involved. <laughs> like, honestly, I've gone and talked to these people and it's like, oh yeah, we were able to shut that off like within 10 minutes because we just hit this button and it like shut off access like behind it, right? And if you don't have that automation before the incident, you're, you're toast. Um, these threat actors are very fast. Um, they're very, very fast. So, um, you, like you read about, oh, we had them, you, I've read incident reports. Oh, we've had, we had them shut down within five hours. Too slow, too yep. slow. Uh, the, the, their goal was done in the first 30 minutes, right? So, um, automate beforehand, practice beforehand, before it happens, like test their automations, build them and test them. I love it. Uh, and thanks for the, yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the shout out. Um, Matt, this has been amazing. I know we could talk for a long time. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Um, if people want to learn more and there's loads of loads more to learn, if people want to learn more, how can they, uh, how can they follow you? For better or worse, I'm still extremely active on Twitter or <laughs> I refuse <laughs> to call it X. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, Matt J J A Y, uh, on, on Twitter is a really good way to get a hold of me. Um, super active on there. And then matche.com, my Twitter handle.com is my, is my website. You can find my blog and my newsletter there. Um, the blog is very much about mental health and personal growth and um, cybersecurity leadership. I do a, I do a series about threat modeling depression on there. Um, kind of applying cybersecurity threat models to, to mental health uh, that was really well received um, so yeah, that's the blog. The newsletter is a little bit of that and, and a lot of bit of, uh, cybersecurity news. I have my podcast, my YouTube. I've recently started a TikTok. I never thought I'd do that, but there's an audience there for cybersecurity news. It's doing, it's doing fairly well. So like I said, my, my one superpower that I will, uh, like, I fully don't have imposter syndrome is, is translating these cybersecurity topics for the layman. And so tech talk is definitely full of the layman because they yell at me in the comments. Oh God. I, yeah, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to That's restart fun. my, uh, I, I find TikTok too addicting to be honest. I just is, like, I had, to, I had to, I was like, I, I can't do this. I'm, I am doing that where I'm just like being a passive, uh, a passive person through life because I'm just like scrolling. Uh, and, oh, scrolling totally. Here. I have to uh, leave my phone out of my bedroom for, for that reason. Uh, I cannot. Yeah. Otherwise I will just TikTok in bed for, for way too late. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I'm loud on the internet, so you can find me. Um, really appreciate it. The newsletter is the thing that I'm like putting the most time and effort into. So uh, if if anyone's listening wants to check that out, I'd, I'd super appreciate it. Because um, that's, yeah, that's how I'm able to kind of help bring on help for the rest of the stuff. So I love it. And yeah, I, we've definitely sponsored the newsletter. I'm sure we will again. And uh, yeah, we're we're big fans of it here and uh, here in Tides as well. Uh, Matt, it was a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me.